Testing. Hello. Hello, everyone. My name is Ava Levin, and I am a member of the Student Advisory Board at the Dole Institute. Welcome to the Dole Institute of Politics, and thank you for attending today's program, presented by the Department of Military History and the Command and General Staff College at Fort Leavenworth. After the program, we will have some time for the audience to ask questions. If you have a question, please raise your hand and a student worker with a microphone will come to you. Please stand if you are able and ask just one brief question. The Dole Institute's mission is to foster civil and respectful discussion around important and often difficult topics please phrase your questions with this in mind. Before we begin, I'd like to remind you to please turn off your cell phones as to not disrupt the program. And now, please join me in welcoming Dr. Sean Kalick, the Director of the Department of Military History. Thank you so much. We brought the big crowd today for Dr. Cotter. Uh, I don't know if it's because last month, Sean Faulkner promised I was going to buy everybody whiskey afterwards, which didn't happen, by the way. So I don't know what, what Dr. Cotter promised you, but we'll see. I have the distinct pleasure of introducing uh, Dr. Colonel Dean, retired Dave Cotter today. Um, he has an illustrious military career, uh, serving as a colonel, and, and prior to that in both um, OIF uh, oh, and OEF. Uh, and commanded at the Battalion and Brigade. After that successful career, he transitioned to come work at CGSC. Uh, he's worked in, I think, three or four di different departments before becoming the dean. It's four, which is fantastic. Uh, he's my former boss, by the way, and my current boss. So he was DMH director prior to me, and he is now the dean. So without further ado, Dr. Cotter will be talking about uh, Winston Churchill as a world leader. Thank you. Thanks. <laughs> Appreciate it, John. Thank you. Mark, am I good? Can you hear me? Yeah. Okay, good, good. Um, first of all, this is daunting. Uh, this is, I've, I've been coming here for uh, over 10 years, and this is the largest gathering that I've seen in this room. So thank you for coming, and, and I'm, I'm glad you could be here. Um, I'm also, uh, I want to thank uh, both the, uh, the Dole Institute and the Department of Military History for allowing me to stay on the roster even though I abandoned ship. Uh, because I really wanted to be part of this, this, this event here is the seventh installment in our, uh, our uh, le World Leaders in Wartime series that, that we've been running. We, I'm using the Royal We, but DMH and the Institute have been running uh, this year. Uh, and I have the real pleasure uh, of, uh, of trying to dig into uh, Winston Churchill a little bit. Uh, there's a problem with that, though. Uh, and the problem with trying to dig into Winston Churchill is that um, there are over a thousand biographies that have been written on this man. A thousand. Um, and for those of us who have never had an original thought in our lives, this is a really a challenge. So, um, I mean, when, you, when we talk about um, the likes of, of uh, John Meacham, uh, Gilbert, uh, uh, Andrew Roberts, uh, these are the folks that have, have written the, the signal uh, biographies of, of, of Churchill and, and covered his ent entire life uh, and in great detail uh, his wartime leadership. Almost most, in most cases though it's been focused on the Second World War. Uh, that's what we're most familiar with when we think about uh, Winston Churchill. Uh, his leadership in, in, in the Second World War and you can all remember looking at the photos of him walking through the, the, the wreckage after the, after the bombings etc. and being that inspirational leader uh, that was really, really necessary at the time. Uh, he was the right person at the right time in the right place. Um, and as he, he mentions uh, in his memoir uh, at the end of the first of his uh, six-volume work on the Second World War, 
that this was his destiny. He believed that it was his destiny to, to lead uh, the, the nation and the empire, a very important part of his, his, uh, his life is this idea of empire. Um, and, uh, and, and so when, we, when you start to look at Churchill, there's just so much to peel back. And so what I'm going to do is I'm going to make a, uh, we're, we're going to talk today, I mean, I'll cover some of the basics just because it's in my contract, but um, I want to, what I really want to talk about today is, is, is uh, this, this individual's strategic vision. Uh, and what I mean by that is he was, he, he, we're going to look at it through a, a specific lens. Um, and what, I, what I, I find really remarkable about uh, Winston Churchill was that he was able to identify um, oftentimes, very early in the game, the three great threats to the world in the 20th century. And they were, as he defines them, uh, Prussian militarism, probably more properly uh, German militarism uh, after 1871, but Prussian militarism because of the Pr Prussian tradition, um, and, the, and the, 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 the environment of aggressiveness that, that was, was in, inherent in that. The second thing was National Socialism. Uh, and the third was Bolshevism, which he would found repugnant from, from early on, uh, uh, early in his career, early in the 20th century, the idea of Bolshevism and, and that kind of uh, widespread socialism, uh, but even more so when he, when, when he starts to deal with the idea of Soviet communism later on. Um, but we should start at the beginning, uh, on the 30th of November in 1874, when he was born. Uh, and he was born in Blenheim Castle, the... Uh, the, the um, uh, palace that was built uh, by and for his forebear, uh, Marlborough, um, and uh, by, uh, fi financed by a grateful nation, as it were. And uh, uh, he was born to Lord Randolph Churchill, who was a uh, sort of a, uh, a contentious uh, member of the Conservative Party in, in, in Britain at the time. Uh, but he was a very influential member of that party, uh, in ch achieving high office in the government. Uh, and he was married to, uh, uh, Lord Randolph was married to an American named uh, Jenny Jerome, Je Jenny Churchill late, later on. And so Churchill, of course, is going to make uh, great hay in his multiple visits to the United States on the fact that he's part American and, and part British. Uh, and, and many of you are familiar with a lot of those quotations that are, that are, that are very amusing. Uh, he was christened uh, Winston Leonard Spencer Churchill. Uh, and, and he grew up and had a relatively normal childhood. He always tried to please his father and was never able to achieve that. A uh, constant theme in his writing throughout his life is, uh, this is what Lord Randolph would have done. This is what my father would have done. I think he would have appreciated this. I think he would have approved of this. And, and you, you see this, this theme over and over again. Uh, but Lord Randolph died well before uh, any any... A true recognition of, of, of Churchill's uh, uh, future success could be realized, and, and Randolph Churchill was very dismissive and very uh, derogatory toward his son, thought he would amount to nothing. Uh, how little he knew, I guess. Um, uh, Churchill um, was not university educated. He went to Sandhurst, the military academy, uh, and he uh, graduated in 1894. Uh, and then he participated in a number of Queen Victoria's little wars. Uh, he fought in four campaigns on three continents in five years. So he got some military experience. Uh, the most famous of those, of course, is his experience during the Boer War, uh, when he was part soldier, part correspondent, and his great escape uh, through that, and of course the way he recounted it and wrote after it, uh, and created of himself uh, rather a national hero. So Ch Churchill uh, uh, abandons the, did not, doesn't abandon the army. He resigns from the army in 1900. In 1901, uh, runs for and is elected to parliament. Um, and, and thus begins his, uh, his uh, public life. Uh, and he will serve in public in, an, in, a, in a variety of different ways. First as a statesman, uh, later as a politician, uh, I'm using these in priority, not in, in, in chronological order. A historian and an author, a prolific author, 37 books, uh, over 800 articles published, uh, and, and, and wrote to, to the, close to the very end of his life. Um, a brilliant orator, uh, and we can talk about that if you'd like later on. Uh, the, I mean, he, he practiced his oratorical skills, and when we listen to him now, it sounds corny. It sounds heavy, ham-handed. It, it, it just doesn't sound very good. But he had worked on this technique and the th nearly theatrical delivery 
uh, for his entire life uh, and was able to uh, absolutely become uh, a motivational uh, speaker both during the First World War and the Second World War. Um, and of course, he is a wartime leader uh, that we, we should talk about. Uh, he wasn't very constant in his, uh, in his uh, political leanings. He started off in, as a member of parliament, as a member of the Conservative Party, because he wanted to emulate his father. Uh, but that didn't last long, because the Conservative Party had begun to turn their back on the concept of free trade, which Churchill believed in very strongly. And so in 1904, he, he uh, jumped ship, or ratted, as he said, uh, over to the Liberal Party, and he's going to stay there for a couple of decades. Um, and uh, and uh, <coughs> he, he uh, joins the Liberal Party because of this free trade uh, opportunity. Um, and he, uh, he, he does a lot of things that, that, that uh, are going to annoy his Tory colleagues later on. Because in 1924, he's going to come back to, to, the, uh, to the Conservative Party. Um, and he's not going to be welcomed with open arms originally because he did, in fact, rat. But he s s quoted himself as saying, you know, one of the things that you, you, you have to understand about this is this is truly remarkable. Anyone can rat, but I only, not only ratted, I re-ratted and came back, to the <laughs> came back to the Conservative Party. Um, so he was a very successful uh, individual. I think we all know that. Uh, but he was also a very flawed human being, and this, this plays a large part in, in, in how we're going to talk about his wartime leadership. Um, he was of a Victorian era. He believed in this Victorian ethic of service, uh, but he also believed in empire. Uh, and he believed that, they, you know, that, that we can improve the people that are living out in these hinterlands. We can help them get to a better place. Uh, today, we kind of reject many of those thoughts and ideas, but, but for, for uh, Churchill, this was an empire was an article of faith. Uh, he opposed women's suffrage for much of his career. Um, he, 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 Jackie Fisher, interesting with Jackie Fisher, don't have a lot of time for it. Some of it's very good, uh, 1911. Some of it's not so good, 1915. So th there's, you know, the, the, that the, the on again, off again, or is it, you know, he said good and not so good. Uh, his refusal to halt the Gallipoli campaign. And those of you that have studied it understand that it was a two-pronged two effort. It required a naval breakthrough of the Dardanelles with the subsequent land attack. Well, when the naval, thing, the naval ex, uh, enterprise failed, he continued stubbornly on with the Gallipoli campaign. It was, it was a mistake that he admits a number of times later in his career, but uh, he just couldn't let it go. He was just too stubborn. He was also stubborn in his support of Edward VII during his abdication crisis. When the rest of the country had, had basically abandoned Edward, go ahead, go take your American divorcee and go, get, go get, uh, have a good time, Churchill was still standing by his man. He was very, very loyal. Um, he got in, <clears throat> after, after the First World War, when Ireland was going through all its upheavals and civil war, he got it all wrong. He could not have done it any worse when he was uh, the Home Secretary. And, uh, uh, I mean, he supported the black and tans. Uh, this was not a, a good part of his record. Um, and another thing, when you get to the Second World War, many of us understand when we look at the, at the British presence in the Pacific Theater, he consistently got the Japanese wrong by underestimating them time and time and time again. Uh, these things all sort of collected and, 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 uh, and Churchill acquired a reputation of being a, a man of poor judgment. Uh, he, didn't, he, he exercised poor judgment in, in international affairs and, not, and in domestic affairs, too. Um, and so this label of him having poor judgment is going to stick with him. Um, as he is, well, I'll talk about that a little bit later on. Um, <coughs> One thing that we shouldn't, should take away from this, though, is he always made a, a point of learning from his mistakes. Uh, and and I'll, I'll, I'll give you one example of that. Um, he had a military experience, combat experience, and so uh, in World War I, he, he was frequently deferred to uh, in, in, in when making military decisions. So when um, the Gallipoli campaign was going on and, and the generals were advising him not to, to continue the, the, the campaign, uh, he overruled them, thinking that he just knew better. But all, I mean, all of his military advisors said, stop this, and Churchill wouldn't listen. During the Second World War, as many of you know, that was not the case. Churchill frequently would throw out a wild idea 
And the Joint Chiefs would just say, no, that's not going to work. And, and he always listened to his advisors after that. So he was a, a, a person that learned from his mistakes. Um, let's move on. It, I'm, I'm going to, that, that, I, I, I want to get into my theme for the day, which is this idea of, of, of a vision, this idea that I can see these three things coming, this, this Prussian militarism, uh, the National Socialist threat, and then the Bolshevism, which will morph into Soviet communism. This all starts for Churchill uh, at the Agadir crisis, and uh, I'm sure most of you are tracking that the, the, a, a gunboat named the Panther, a German gunboat, showed up at, the, at Agadir in Morocco and, and threatened uh, to, to take action against the French that were there. Uh, this, for, Hitler, for, uh, for Churchill, was a, a wake-up call. It was his, his big aha moment in terms of Germany. Um, he really wasn't much interested in Germany, um, and the reason you know that is because he didn't write about it, because he wrote about everything. But he didn't write about uh, Germany uh, much before 1911. After 1911, he writes a lot about Germany. Um, but, uh, you know, he, he's, he's interested in the empire, uh, he's a lifelong Francophile, and Germany was just never part of his, uh, his calculus. Uh, after the spring of 1911, it is a huge part of his calculus. Uh, because what he sees now is, is a rising Germany uh, that wants to um, expand its, its European hegemony and by so doing threaten the empire. Well, for, for, for Churchill, of course, the, the empire is, is sacred and, and you can't make a threat to that without us taking it seriously. Um, it really did shake him to his core um, and he, he was thinking about all the different things and then he starts to contemplate um, how could this be, how could this affect us in the long run? And one of the things that he determines is that this could be a continental war in Europe. Uh, and Germany could be the author of this continental war. And then he starts to think about France and how they're defending along a line uh, to, the, to their east. And he's looking at Belgium and the Netherlands. And he, so he just, he starts to ruminate. And in July, two months after the Agadir crisis, he sends a memo to the Committee on Imperial Defense in which he basically describes the opening campaign of the Western Front in the First World War three years later. He says, uh, the German army would break through the line of the River Meuse on the 20th day of the war. The French will fall back to Paris. The impetus of the German attack would slowly weaken the more it was extended. And from the 30th day, the Russian army would begin to exercise pressure on, on what we would be called later on the Eastern Front, and the British would be in Flanders. That's a pretty accurate depiction. And his timeline is pretty, pretty accurate as well. You know, he ab absolutely was uh, uh, prescient in this regard. And so he has this idea of this vision that there's going to be a continental war, um, and this is not taken very seriously by the, Ger by the British government. Um, it's kind of like, okay, we, we thank you for your service, um, but then they can't, they can't muzzle him, for lack of a better word. And so they decided to make him the first Lord of the Admiralty, um, give him a job. And so he goes to the Admiralty. But what he does when he goes to the Admiralty is make absolutely sure uh, that from 1911 on, uh, the British Navy is going to be prepared uh, for, the, for, the, for the war that he is convinced is coming. Um, and it, there, there, there ensues a naval race, uh, which, which, which every, I'm sure you're all familiar with that, the building of the ships. And, 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 uh, and Germany, of course, is relatively late to the Industrial Revolution, so they want to accelerate their production. And uh, at first, it, it, the, 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 the back and forth between uh, Churchill and his, his German counterpart is, is uh, basically it's a tit for tat. If you build one ship, we'll build two, declares Churchill. But then, in two occasions, uh, between 1911 and 1914, he offers kind of a truce, uh, where he offers to, to stop the shipbuilding program if they will stop the shipbuilding program. Let's stop this financial craziness. Uh, because the amount of money being dumped into, into this, uh, this naval shipbuilding program is just astronomical. Uh, and, and this continues for a while, uh, but, but the Germans out reject entirely uh, the, these overtures, these truce overtures. Uh, so Hitler, uh, Hitler <laughs> excuse me, so um, <laughs> Churchill continues to, to build uh, capability. He, it's not just building ships. One of the things he does is he gets um, uh, 
ownership. Uh, They get 51% ownership in the Anglo-Persian oil company because the modern ships that they're building now are oil-fired. They're not coal-fired. And so those coaling stations are are all um, interesting, but hopefully they're going to become irrelevant. And we're going to be able to fuel our ships. Now, you still need places to store the fuel, of course, but that's a logistics problem he's going to leave to people like me. Um, The the preparation, though, um, did not stop uh, Germany's uh, desire for growth and expansion. Um, And uh, from 1911 on... Churchill's focus remains being prepared for what he sees as the, as the obvious German threat. Um, and one of the things that happens now is he now becomes the target of considerable ridicule in the press and in, in Parliament. Um, the Germans aren't interested in a war. The Germans aren't. All the Germans are trying to do is build a navy for their own self-defense, <clears throat> et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, but he's gone back and looked at uh, the German uh, experiences in German Southwest Africa uh, l- late in the, uh, in, the, in the 19th century, and he's, he's pretty sure that that's not the case. He sees an inherent aggression here, born of a militaristic society that has to be satisfied, and he writes as much. Um, and so he does not let up. Uh, the pressure to, to build and be prepared uh, becomes the, the, the signpost for everything that the admiral's doing, as, the admiralty is doing, as long as he's first lord of the admiralty. Um, when they enter, when they do finally enter World War One, uh, <coughs> they, they they will do so with with a fleet that is much more prepared than it was when he took when he took uh, the office of the first lord of the admiralty, um, and it, it, he also. Uh, uh, targets the size of the fleet so that it's big enough to do two things, defend the homeland and be able to operate in an expeditionary manner. Because he also forms, um, for the first time in, in, in the British system, a, a uh, I'm not sure what you'd call it, you can't, you can't call it a joint staff, but he calls it, it's, it's the Admiralty War Group. And he forms this group and they meet to decide, this is before the onset of the war. What's the strategy going to be? And they decide on four priorities. The first one is we have to be able to get the British Expeditionary Force to France. The second thing is we have to be able to blockade Germany. And we all know that that blockade lasted the entirety of the war and was extremely effective. Um, uh, They also want to make sure they can find the high seas fleet in port. And and finally, they want to make sure they keep the sea lines of communication open for both military and commercial traffic to to keep the sea lines open. And so they establish those four priorities. They build a strategy around that. There's nothing like this that the Army's doing. The Army doesn't have any... They they haven't built a vision like this at all. Um, It's it's interesting, and it goes forward. Uh, This strategy seems to work. Uh, You know, know, we're not going to have Jutland until, until, uh, until Churchill's out of office. But the preparation of, of, of the fleet and the preparation of the strategy is, is what's going to enable uh, success for the Royal Navy throughout the, throughout the war. Um, the, so once in 1914, when the war that he's predicted does in fact happen, in, in spite of all the experts' uh, opinions to the contrary, uh, uh, as the war progresses, he thinks that we really need, the British really need to help relieve pressure on Russia uh, because the pressure on Russia has been considerable. So what he, he concocts this idea of Gallipoli that we already mentioned briefly, where the idea is going to be to get into the Black Sea by forcing the Dardanelles with the Navy and also conducting the land campaign over the Gallipoli Peninsula. Well, We've already discussed that you had to have both parts of that for the strategy to work. You didn't, they, they were not able to force the Dardanelles because the, the Ottoman Empire had built these in, incredibly strong forts with heavily, uh, they were heavily armed forts uh, that were able to, uh, to fire across the, the Dardanelles at their narrow points. And so the, 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 the British lost six ships in one day trying to do this. And after a while, you figure out that this probably isn't going to work. And so the Navy said, we can't do that anymore. And yet they continued with the land campaign, and I think we've already talked about that. Um, And the bottom line on all of this is Churchill gets fired. Uh, What they do is the the government gets elected out of office, and they are able, Asquith is able to put together a coalition government on one condition, that Churchill's not part of it. 
And so Churchill could have done a number of things then. He's a sitting member of parliament. Uh, he's, he, you know, he's got a number of uh, business interests. He, of course, he's, he's writing prolifically. He's basically surviving on what he makes from writing uh, through most of his career, actually. Uh, so he could have done a lot. But he opts to go to France uh, as a major uh, and serve in the, in the front lines. Well, once he gets to France, uh, he's able to get command of a battalion. So he's promoted temporarily to lieutenant colonel, and he, he is in command of the six Royal Scots Fusiliers. Um, and he's, <clears throat> he's, you know, who are operating in the British zone, um, and he's, he, he, he does a number of attacks. He operates in no man's land. He is uh, with, with, with the troops, and uh, you get a picture of that in, in, the, in, in the lower picture there is with him sitting with his troops. Um, and the, uh, the, 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 the really kind of earned a lot of stripes by doing that. He didn't stay at home. He went to the front, uh, and he didn't just go to the front and stay in the rear with the gear, as they say. He went to the front, um, and, and this, this did a lot to um, revive his reputation, if you will. And uh, the, the <clears throat> problem was that his command couldn't, and it doesn't really turn out to be a problem, um, the, the command goes away because the, there's a reorganization and the six Scots Fusiliers are absorbed into other organizations. So his job goes away. He loses his temporary promotion and he says, okay, well, I'm, I'm out of here. And he goes back to, to England. He goes back to England on the 16th of May. Um, which is just about uh, 60 days before the Battle of the Somme. So uh, he, he did, uh, if you're going to escape the front lines, that was the time to do it. Uh, so he did a pretty good job of that. Um, um, he gets back to the government, and he, he does fill several posts in the government. He's immediately made the, the Minister of Munitions uh, because they need somebody that can do the job, and the folks that had been in there couldn't do it. So despite the proscription of him being in the government, he comes back to be the minor, Minister of Munitions. He's going to fill several posts uh, between, uh, between uh, 1916 and 1929, um, and that, that's also going to include the time where he switches back to the, to the Tory party, the Conservative party. Uh, but he'll be Chancellor of the Exchequer, um, he, he, uh, minister, he'll be the Colonial Secretary, Home Secretary. Um, and as, after World War I ended, he, had, he held out hope that, that this defeated Germany would become a bulwark, a moral bulwark against Bolshevism and what was going on in, in, in Russia at the time and, and later on the Soviet Union. Very unhappy with the spread of communism, wants to get it stopped, sees it as a real evil, and sees Germany as that, as that, uh, that entity, that, that buffer, if you will. Um, uh, as we all know, that doesn't really work out uh, because National Socialism uh, rises, and in 1933, uh, Adolf Hitler becomes the Chancellor of Germany. Um, <clears throat> uh, he was, uh, from the period of about 1927 on, um, often the lone voice uh, decrying uh, fascism in general and National Socialism in particular. Uh, and from 1933 on, Hitler was a personal and, and regular target of, of, uh, of uh, Churchill's writings, and, uh, and, and uh, he didn't get on the radio. The BBC wouldn't, put, wouldn't let him go on the radio. So when he wrote his articles and, 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 uh, and other essays, uh, Hitler was often a specific target. Uh, Hitler, uh, Mussolini... Oh. I'm back to Churchill now, okay? Um, Churchill also had some eyes and ears out. He had some censors throughout the government that were providing him information that they probably shouldn't have been. Uh, but he was able to go public with how the Lufthansa-Luftwaffe connection was happening, how the, the uh, German pilots were being trained in the commercial airlines, uh, how the tractor factories um, looked suspiciously like tanks, and the, the products they were turning out those kind of things, and, uh, and he was able to talk about maneuvers that weren't supposed to happen that were happening, and, and, and so he was, he, he was the canary in the coal mine, and he kept telling every, uh, from, from uh, all these things. Uh, and from 1937 onwards, uh, he was a constant voice against the movement of appeasement that was all throughout Europe, Western Europe. Uh, after World War I, where generations of, of, of young people had been slaughtered. Uh, there was no appetite for, for, for another war. And so this idea of appeasement was alive and well and, and 
Churchill is, is, is one very strident, uh, some would say shrill, voice against this idea of, of, uh, of, of uh, appeasement. Um, and he's roundly criticized. He's criticized in the House of Commons. He's criticized in the public forums. He's criticized in the press. Um, and he's frequently heckled. Again, he gets the, well, what about Gallipoli heckling when he, when he goes to his car from his office, that kind of thing. Um, and so, uh, you know, it, 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 he, he, he is basically a very thick-skinned person. And, uh, and one of his biographers, Andrew Roberts, said very, very specifically that his sense of duty, his Victorian sense of duty, just told him that he had to put up with this because he had to get the message out. That, that National Socialist, Nazi fascism, was an evil that had to be stopped at all costs. And so he kept banging that drum, and, uh, and he was grossly unpopular um, until later, when he wasn't unpopular. Um, uh, and, and, of course, we all know what happened with Czechoslovakia, with, with Chamberlain. Uh, and Chamberlain, of course, was a man of extraordinarily high moral character who thought he was doing absolutely the right thing for the world and for Great Britain. Um, it just didn't work out that way because there was no predicting what, what Hitler and, and the National Socialist Movement was going to do. Regardless, um, uh, it, in, uh, in 1939, uh, Churchill is actually called back, and he's called back to be the first Lord of the Admiralty. And the signal that goes out from the Admiralty, uh, he didn't author it, it was just sent out uh, to the fleet, was Winston is back. Uh, and so, and, and, and that message was met with a lot of positive response. The Navy was glad to have him back. This is a person that's trying to, trying to move out and, and get after the Nazi threat. Uh, the Navy and, and much of the rest of the country at this point really wanted to do that. Uh, and so he's, he's speaking, he's saying the right things, and, and he's being well received. Um, he becomes the prime minister, his lifelong goal, he becomes the prime minister and fulfills his destiny, so he says, um, in, 1940, in May of 1940, following the Norway crisis. Um, and now, if you stop and, th stop and think about what's happening in 1940, in, in May of 1940, uh, Britain has fled the continent. We're out of here. Um, Norway has fallen. France is about to fall. Uh, the Soviet Union is now a Nazi ally. Uh, Italy is on its way to an alliance with, with Germany. I mean, they're already allied in all but name. Um, and the USA is saying we want nothing to do with what's going on in Europe. So if you do that calculus, you think, oh, we've got to get out of this. We're in this by ourselves. And the British Foreign Office does just that. They start to work on, on peace negotiations through Mussolini. What they were trying to do was use Mussolini to get the war uh, uh, derailed, if you will. It stopped. Um, but, you know, even though the logic had told the Foreign Office to find a way to stop the war, um, Winston S. Churchill was not a data-driven human being. <laughs> um, he was absolutely uh, convinced that if we, if getting a peace with, with uh, Nazi Germany at this point would be the end of Western civilization. And he short-circuited at every turn. Uh, Lord Halifax, who was the, uh, the, the uh, foreign minister, uh, was just, uh, I mean, every time he tried something, uh, Churchill was able to outmaneuver him. Um, he had, was so convinced throughout the 1930s and 1940s that he stood against his government he stood against his class of people, he stood against popular opinion, and he stood against everything because of, he was convinced of the rightness of his, of his cause, which was to protect Western civilization and the empire. It's all, it, for, for Churchill, it always came down to the empire. And, uh, you know, you can blame that on really nothing except uh, Victorian confidence. You know, the Victorians and, and the Edwardians before them were so confident that what they were doing is right. Uh, that they were going to, you know, make the world better. You're going to have to do what we do, but we're going to make you better. Uh, so it was a little it's kind of interesting at that point. Um, after World War II, things get a little different. Um, and you'll notice the three pictures here. There's going to be an evolution uh, of things. Um, it's important to note, though, that Winston Churchill was always a loyal ally. He was a loyal ally in politics. He was a loyal ally to his friends. He was a loyal ally to Stalin. 
Uh, he knew the, the butcher's bill that had been tallied up against the Soviets in World War II, and he knew the sacrifices that the Soviets had made. He also knew, uh, it, well, he, he also suspected that uh, Stalin, for all his promises about democratic processes following the end of the war, uh, were probably going to be mooted by, uh, by a move back toward uh, what, what uh, Churchill kept calling Bolshevism, but by now is that unique uh, flavor of Bolshevism called Soviet communism. Um, on 27 February, though, he returned from Yalta, convinced that Stalin would keep his word to allow democratic processes in the countries that the Red Army had occupied. Um, many of the earlier historians of, of uh, Churchill's life uh, thought that that was hogwash, that that was an information operation. Um, Andrew Roberts, however, had um, access to, he was the first historian to have access to um, the king's uh, diaries uh, with his weekly meetings recorded. He had weekly meetings with Churchill in, in Buckingham Palace and in other places, but when in London, in Buckingham Palace. And, uh, and so Roberts was able to note that there were a number of entries saying how much that uh, he trusted Stalin would keep his word, because Stalin had kept his word throughout the war. So he had a pretty good track record under extreme duress of keeping his word. Um, these pictures depict the period between 1945 and March of 1946. <laughs> he changed his assessment because of all the things that, uh, that uh, happened. Uh, I mean, it was a particularly brutal put down of the, uh, of the Polish government to include the disappearance of a number of Polish notables. Uh, so this is the second time this has happened in, in, what, six years, because that's exactly what Hitler did as well. They got rid of most of the, uh, the Polish intelligentsia. So now Poland's grown another generation of them, and they're eliminated as well. Many of them were eliminated. And, uh, and so he goes to Fulton, Missouri. Uh, Churchill does. He goes to Fulton, Missouri, and he makes a speech. Now, he gave the speech to Harry Truman to read before he did it, and, and Truman said, noted, got it. And... Uh, and then uh, and, and Churchill made the speech, and it, was, it had like a nuclear effect. Um, the, the, the words he used were from Stettin in the Baltic to Trieste on the Adriatic, and Iron Curtain has descended across the continent. Behind the line lie the capitals of the ancient states of Central and Eastern Europe in what I must call the Soviet sphere. And he goes on and on. And, and, and the, but this is not the first time he'd used the Iron Curtain phrase, uh, he'd used it several times earlier, but not to this audience and not with this amount of media coverage. Um, the media response was almost universally negative, and it was universally loud. Uh, he was criticized for this very, very, at the highest volume levels, for lack of a better word, huge headlines that just condemned the speech. But what he had done, again, this is the third threat of the 20th century, he identifies it in 1946, and it's not till 1948 where the rest of the world starts to come around. But the canary in the coal mine, again, is Winston Churchill. He was the canary in World War I, World War II, and now for the Cold War. Um, and he is... Uh, well, I'm not saying he goes into seclusion, but he... he, he he underwent a number of threats uh, to himself uh, at the time because they, you know, th this, this man is trying to start a war. He's trying to, you know, irritate the, the Soviets into responding and reacting. Um, in, 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 in true British fashion, you know, he was, right after VE Day, uh, he was put out of office. His party was put out of office. So he was out of job. So he, he carries... Um, uh, you know, most of the Western world through the Second World War, especially in, in England when, when things were so dire, especially in 1940, the Battle of Britain, when it was them against the world. Uh, he did all those things, and he gave those rousing speeches of uh, blood, sweat, and tears, etc. Well, and as soon as the war is over, they, they threw him out. Um, but all of a sudden, they start to see with the Korean conflict rising up and, and, and the Chinese Revolution and Stalin uh, getting more and more aggressive in the East, hold on, we need to go to that box that we keep Winston in and break the glass and get him out again. So in 1951, he's made prime minister again. Um, and this was, this was probably something 
that was a mistake. He shouldn't have done this because he was not the same man in 1951. As you can imagine, uh, going through the trials and travails of, of being a national leader, and it's sometimes the world leader uh, during the Second World War, had taken a toll on Churchill. Uh, he did not have the energy level. He did not have the patience. Uh, and and it, he was just probably not the right person to do that. Additionally, uh, he was um, diminished uh, by a, a several small strokes and one large stroke, which they hid from the public. Uh, he, his um, his um, uh, recuperation was, was masked as a, I don't, a, a hiatus, if you will. Uh, but it, it, at the end of the day, he was a diminished human being after that uh, because of the toll it took on him. Um, he was unable to, to maintain office and finally resigned in 1955. Uh, and of course, you know, he, he lives for another 10 years. Uh, but again, in diminish, he, over time, his capacity diminishes and diminishes. He still came up with some of those uh, uh, terribly barbarous but wonderful quips that he's famous for. Um, you know, they, they, they sting, but they're, they're also very amusing. Um, but the, uh, uh, the, the, the message that I want to leave is that uh, he set the, foot, the, the world afoot for World War I. He set the world afoot for World War II, and he set the world afoot for the Cold War. In all three cases, he among, alone among the world's senior leaders uh, did this. He alone was the one that got on his bully pulpit and shouted from the mountaintops that this was a problem in all three cases. Uh, and in every one of those cases, he was pilloried um, until he wasn't pilloried um, after the war started. So... So many things to talk about with Winston Churchill, so very many things, um, and I just wanted to focus it on something that we per perhaps hadn't talked about before, and that is this idea that he had a vision, uh, he understood the three big threats and was able to, um, uh, to do his best at his level to address them each time. Uh, and, and I think uh, we probably owe this person a, a debt of gratitude. That's what I've got for you. Um, do you have any questions, or you want to, sir? Uh, I was stationed in Germany. Could, could you wait a second, sir? Did they want to, there we go. I was stationed in Germany in the late 60s, and one of the things that we were able to do was get to Britain, and at the British Museum of Natural History, they had tapes of some of his speeches. And the emphasis of almost every speech at that point, we are not yet in the war, was the Yanks are coming, the Yanks are coming, because he was relying on us. And if the Germans would not have sunk all of our shipping going over, we would have stayed out for another year. So it all boiled down to dollars and cents, and the Yanks are coming. It does, in both cases. Um, uh, the Japanese helped us a lot. And of course, Hitler declaring war on us <laughs> was another motor. But that's a great point. Um, and isn't it interesting when you listen to his speeches? I don't know if it affects you the same way, but when I listen to his speeches, I find them moving. I mean, I'm, okay, coach, let's go. You know, I, I just, I really find them very, very persuasive. Uh, sir. Uh, is it true that uh, the British plan to move their government to Canada the day after the Germans stopped their bombing campaign um, because they were just getting pilloried and pounded? Yeah, I think the technical term is they were getting schwacked. Um, uh, the, um, it was, the bombing campaign was brutal. Um, there was a move afoot. There, there was much discussion about relocating the government. Uh, there was a lot more discussion about relocating the royal family. Um, and, uh, it, of course, neither one of these things came to fruition. I don't know if the government would have relocated. I know Churchill wouldn't have. Uh, but the king made it very clear that they were not leaving. Uh, the, the princesses went to the, to the countryside to be away from the worst of it. But, yeah, uh, it, was, it was an interesting turn of events because... Uh, the king and queen, believe it or not, had a huge morale effect, a, a positive morale effect 
uh, by staying in, in, in the city and actually walking through and talking to the crowds. And one of the things that, um, that uh, Churchill did was he was a weeper. He cried at the drop of a hat. Um, but he, he's, frequently uh, he'd be out walking and he'd look at the destruction and he'd be crying. And the public loved it, that it hurt him enough that he was, that he was crying. So, yeah, it's interesting and how, much, how important it was that they didn't relocate to Canada. Thanks for that. Thank you very much for your talk. I enjoyed it. And uh, I apologize for asking you a question of about nine centuries prior to your talk. But uh, what I read was that Winston Churchill's family um, uh, claimed ancestry to some of the French that came over with William the Conqueror in the Battle of Hastings. It's on the um, battle roll at the Battle Abbey. Um, a Frenchman by the name of F. D. Corsi. Can you uh, confirm or deny that? Uh, I, I cannot. But could you hold on a second? Yes. Abel, can I put you on the spot? Can you? <laughs> I found a whole lot like people who claim to have fought in the American Revolution. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Um, the, the Department of Military has, History has a wide range of talent. That's why I reached out to Dr. Abel. <laughs> Ma'am. So of the thousand books that you read in preparing for this presentation today, um, what is the number one book that you would recommend for the amateur or recreational historian? I would, I would offer two. Um, because I can't do math. You said one. I would offer two. And the reason is because of the historiographical difference. Um, Martin Gilbert probably wrote the flagship biography of, of um, Winston Churchill. Uh, but that was written in the 80s, 90s. Um, Andrew Roberts' book was published in, I think, 2017 or 18. But he had access to significantly more sources that had not yet been touched. And so he offers uh, depth and nuance that, that Gilbert doesn't have. Um, one of the things I found that was very interesting was that um, uh, Gilbert makes a big point of the fact, uh, and, and Roberts does as well, uh, that um, uh, Churchill was very, um, I don't know how you say this, he was kind of a lone ranger in his um, uh, the fact that he wasn't an anti-Semite, uh, which was so uh, rampant in the, in the British government at the time. And so he, he was um, really willing to work um, uh, deals, if you will, with the, with the Zionist effort that was secondary in both World War I and, and World War II. So. Would you go back and please end? Uh, your three, the three threats that he had, would you just briefly talk about those? Yes, sir. You, you want to know what they were? Um, Prussian militarism, um, National Socialist fascism, Nazism, and uh, Bolshevism, and then later on as it matures into Soviet communism. Those are the three threats that he saw as the, as the existential threats to Western civilization and Europe in particular uh, during the 20th century. So he got a lot wrong. I think I, I, I tried to lay out a, a list of the things that he got wrong, but he got the, the, those right. So. From what you had for the autobiography that hit, uh, uh, Churchill wrote himself in the biographies that you're talking about, was the view of, of uh, Churchill's view of himself different by those two guys than what he thought? My sense is no. Um, my, he said that, um, I'm going to get this wrong because I haven't written it down and I've reached that age. Um, he thought that Gilbert gushed a little too much. Um, um, but of course, you know, because he, he, he got to look at all the, because the, Gilbert was sharing his notes with him before he died, um, even though the book wasn't published until much later. But, um, he thought Gilbert was too laudatory uh, a little bit, uh, and, and I can concur that that's, it, it's, it's quite praise, praiseworthy, so, yeah. 
when uh, Churchill was defeated or the Conservative Party in, what, 45? Yes, sir. Um, was it primarily a function of domestic policy that beat them, or was it foreign policy? It was all domestic. Um, it, I, I don't think anybody would have, uh, would, would have questioned him on his foreign policy at that point. Uh, later on in the 50s, they do, uh, but, but in, at that point, they don't because, but, but there's no food, you know, there's a food shortage, uh, the, the people are, are uh, the women are, are, are leaving the jobs that they've grown to like, and the men are coming, it's a lot of dissatisfaction, and, uh, and, and so it was all domestic issues, inflation, terrible inflation, and now, then they had a huge debt hanging over their head that they knew for, the, for this war, so it was all domestic issues, and... Uh, I have a title of a book here, written by a Richard Langworth, and he's an English writer. And the title of it is Churchill in the Avoidable War, Could World War II Have Been Prevented? Yeah, I, I love counterfactuals. Um, it's, yes, I, I guess World War II could have been, I mean, World War I is the one that looks so preventable to me. Uh, when you look at the, the chain reaction that, that could have been erupted, interrupted at several points along the way. And then, of course, you know, there's, there's, a, there's a sense among many people that World War II is no, no more than the second chapter of World War I. Uh, not really, in my opinion, but a lot of folks think that. But uh, is World War II, prim you know, as long as you have an actor uh, like Adolf Hitler, uh, who, who, who is someone I've studied much more than I have um, Winston Churchill, uh, I, I don't think so. It was going to, it was going to go to war, in, in my opinion. That's, of course, I'm one of, what, 70 people here, so there's probably 69 other opinions. So, uh, Tom Huber. Okay. I uh, enjoyed your presentation very much. Uh, you noted that uh, Winston Churchill was uh, Minister of Munitions after uh, 1916, and uh, at exactly that uh, historical moment, uh, uh, there were amazing new uh, methods of industrial mobilization being developed in uh, Germany by uh, Walter Rattenau and in the U.S. by uh, Bernard Baruch, and uh, so that you get these uh, amazing uh, 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 rushes of uh, material onto the Western uh, Front uh, uh, on a presidented scale. But my question is, uh, to your knowledge, was uh, Winston Churchill, as Minister of Munitions, involved in anything like that on the British side? On the developmental side of it, Tom? Uh, in terms of the reorganization, reorganization of industry for the war effort. Y yes. Um, one of the reasons they pulled him back in was they were pretty sure he was the only one that could get the thing organized. Uh, because, he, I mean, he's kind of an irresistible force uh, and, and is recognized as such. Um, in terms of innovating new, new weaponry, no, but innovating new systems and organizing it because all the wrong... The, Munitions weren't going to the right place at the right time, and he was able to streamline that to some degree. Now, once it got uh, into France, it was still a mess, as you know, so, but um, at least they got it there. <laughs> so, are we good? Oh. I used to teach a survey of Western civilization at the college level, and I would read my students excerpts of Churchill's speeches, and in a more cynical age, that it was so compelling to them, and I can imagine what it was like at that particular time to, for people who were caught in their, in their predicament. He had a tremendous way of words. And I also have read his History of the English-Speaking Peoples in four volumes. Mm -hmm. It may not be the best history in the world, but it's a tremendous read because he's got that the fascinating way of putting things. He does have a great, a great pen. He's easy to read. Very, yeah, I agree completely, sir. Yeah. Then, and then we'll come back to you, sir. Oh, never mind. We're coming to you. You said that um, Churchill shortchanged the Japanese. It, would that be possibly because he had a colonial attitude, like most Europeans did toward Asia? Yeah, he admits later on uh, that it was because they were Asian that he underestimated them. Um, and it's interesting because, you know, they had the huge, you know, 
uh, ports in, 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 in the area, and he was convinced that they would, they'd survive with no problem. Uh, and then when, when battleships start getting sunk, it, it, it changes his mind. But, but he, he, he underestimates them completely. Uh, yeah, and, I, and he admits as much later on. that it, it, uh, He didn't call it ra racist, but he did intimate that. So those little people can't fight us, that kind of thing. So This is also a man that was in Sudan. Um, and, uh, you know, they, they were allowed to use machine guns on... on Africans, et cetera, but they, they wouldn't, you know, early in the, in the late 18th century, they wouldn't use machine guns on other white people. It wasn't gentlemanly. So, so. there's a great book called uh, The Social History of the Machine Gun by a fe fellow named Ellis. Great book <laughs> where he describes that. Uh, Martin? I'm not sure if I need a microphone or not. I'm loud as it is. But uh, Dean Cotter, could you... Um, shed some light on Churchill's views towards Israel during his second term as prime minister? Very interesting um, and changing quite a bit. Always, um, uh, you know, if, if I get this wrong, tell me, but the, 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 he was always empathetic uh, to, to, the, to the idea of, or receptive to the idea of, of a Jewish homeland. Um, not sure he liked the way it, it, it turned out, but um, he was always sympathetic to that. And part of that is because um, he was um, he wasn't anti-Semitic, um, which so many of the Brits were in the government. Well, the Americans, Germans, Austrians, you name it. So yeah, it's, it's pretty rampant that way. So does that help? Yeah, yeah he was he was empathetic to it. Am, am I getting the high sign yet? Are we good? Uh, let, me, let me go ahead. We, we've hit about the hour mark. I, I just want to close out a couple of things, but first of all, I got, excuse me. You may have figured out that, that I am a fan. Um, <laughs> um, oh, I don't want to leave that there, because I really like Winston. I don't want him to fall down. Um, I, I did want to, I, I, I wanted to sharpen our focus to look at those three things. I hope that was helpful. Uh, there's a lot of things we could have spoken about today. Um, but his recognition of the danger of Prussian militarism, his early recognition of the danger of Prussian militarism, uh, Nazi fascism, and uh, Bolshevism that matured into Soviet communism uh, was truly remarkable in terms of strategic vision, uh, in my opinion. Uh, his voice was often muffled or, or, or uh, shorted uh, by all the mistakes that he had made, and he recognized that as well. Uh, that, you know, his, his warnings were, f you know, frequently not taken at face value until, of course, the shooting started. Um, I, I would argue that we're all the better for him having lived uh, when he did. Um, uh, and the last thing I'd leave with you is the more I read about Winston Churchill, the more I like him. So thank you very much for your time. I appreciate it. There he is. So. Great. Thank you very much for coming out today. We appreciate it.